Dear Father, uh, I'm excited, Father, by your grace and mercy to this body. I'm excited, Father, that even as we toil and, and, and put our hard efforts to building a church and ministering to those in it, Father, we're just so inadequate to do that work. We're just, we don't, um, I mean, honestly, Father, if we confess to you honestly what we think, half the time we don't know what we're doing. Uh, we, we don't know what to say. As a body to one another, sometimes we don't know what to do. We don't understand what the plan needs to be. We aren't equipped to see the future well enough to anticipate all that's coming down the road. But, Father, I am so thankful I don't need to do any of that because you do it all. Uh, This is your church. You build it. You care for it. And the day it was appointed to begin, you began it. And the day it's appointed to end, when and ever that might happen, you'll do that too. And in between, Father, you'll take us where we're supposed to be. I just pray, Father, we are listening well enough that we don't walk away from you and that uh, we're following attentively in all the things you're doing, Father. But I thank you even now for the work you have done and are doing to build us up one body at a time, just as Peter says, Father, one living stone at a time. I can see you building that wall of, of living stones in front of me. And as the man you've called to minister to this community along with others, I'm, I confess, Father, it's daunting. You tell us that we give an account for the souls who you entrust to us, Father, and that is um, that's a... That's a promise that will keep a pastor up at night. But, Father, what a, what a privilege it is that you would use the likes of us and minister to others in wondrous ways by your Spirit. And so it's such a privilege. We thank you, Father, for the, for the privilege to be a part of this body. And, Father, as I look at your word tonight, I so thank you, Father, for the mysteries of it, for the power of it, for the wisdom of it, and that you then come alongside us and you reveal it to us by your Spirit. Things we could not know apart from your revelation. Thank you, Father, for that. We learn it tonight, Father, in the hope that we'll be more pleasing to you in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, friends. Chapter 12. Well, the die has been cast. We've reached the point of no return for Israel and for Jesus. He's made his uh, best case to Israel as their Messiah. That's what we've been studying. He's come with a kingdom, offering it to them freely. And nonetheless, most of the people have remained unconvinced. And now you have Israel's leaders turning openly hostile against him and his offer. That's what we've got to now at the beginning and at the middle of chapter 12. But now, obviously, this impasse cannot last forever. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, how long is he supposed to make the offer? How long does he keep walking around trying to prove himself to people who don't want to hear it? How long could that possibly go on? I mean, what is the logical limit? There is a limit. There was going to be a limit, and we've reached that limit. Sooner or later, a decision is made, a time has come when either Israel receives their kingdom or they don't in that day. Right? I mean, logically, it had to be. And Matthew is now ready to show us that final straw, that moment. The moment when Israel lost the kingdom, or as I titled it, when paradise was lost for them. At least for that generation. Not for all time, not for all Israel, but for that period of history. And to bring us to that point, Matthew must first explain to us why the offer of the kingdom could not last forever for that generation. And that's where we start in chapter 12, verse 15. That's where we start. The scripture says, but Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. So it starts there with Matthew saying that Jesus was fully aware of the Pharisees' conspiracy, and so he withdraws for a time to avoid further conflict. So what apparently happened was after he was in the synagogue healing the man with a withered hand, um, he left, probably retreated up into the hills around the Galilee. 
And Matthew says crowds followed him as usual, and Jesus continued performing healing for all of them as usual. But the sense here is one of a fleeting opportunity. I mean, Jesus knows that the kingdom offer is about to be withdrawn. He understands the circumstances he's in, and that just gave him all the more reason to do as much healing as he could in the meantime, because the time for mass healing is also about to stop. And there's a reason for that, which we come to later as we get through this chapter. But Jesus knows that. And so it's almost as if right before the store closes, you've got a bunch of shoppers coming in for some last-minute bargains, and Jesus is trying to get as many in the door as he can. But now I want you to notice a new detail that appears for the very first time in Matthew's account. Jesus tells the crowds, don't tell anybody else about me. Now that's a fundamental shift. That's a complete change. That is a new thing. It's going to become the regular thing. It's going to become the norm going forward. But it's a change. That statement in verse 16 is your clue that something is happening right now. He's beginning his transition from a kingdom proposal to a kingdom program. Now, those of you who've been around for a while, you'll remember those terms. For those who haven't, let me just recap. The idea of the kingdom, that is of God bringing Jesus to earth to rule the physical earth as king from Jerusalem, this kingdom that we're still waiting for, that is coming one day. It started as a promise given to a man named Abraham and then later to his descendants, a promise that there would be this kingdom that would come on earth and that Abraham and his descendants would be a part of it. And then when Jesus finally arrived, that promise became a proposal. Jesus said, here I am, the kingdom of God is at hand. But now that they're rejecting it, Well, the kingdom doesn't go away. It just has to move forward a step in the plan of God. And the next phase is the kingdom program. Rather than the kingdom coming to Israel, for a time it's going to go to the Gentiles. And in that way, it's a program, a program of recruiting, of recruiting people to join the kingdom. That is, to turn in their earthly passport for the kingdom passport, to come to faith, in other words, in Jesus. But there is still yet one more phase down the road. At some point, when Jesus is ready to come back and set up his kingdom on earth, it moves from a program to a place. So it goes from a promise to a proposal to a program to a place. Here, in this moment, in this chapter, at this verse, you're seeing the transition start between a proposal and a program. He's beginning that transition. Now, in the period of the kingdom proposal, what he's been doing up to this point... The whole point of his ministry was to announce himself to Israel and to propose this union, as it were. I'm your king. I have a kingdom for you. Accept me and I'll give you your kingdom. It's a proposal. But once they've rejected that proposal, now the plan of God has to move to a new phase, as I said, to this idea of a program. And at that point, the entire thrust of Jesus' earthly ministry changes. Everything will change. And we'll cover more of this later. I don't intend to do it all now. But take my word for it, at least for now. Everything he does, why he does it, and how he does it is about to change. And Matthew is really good at showing us that, which is why you'll see it for yourself soon enough. He moves, in a sense, or in effect, from openly declaring himself and trying to recruit the nation of Israel to receive him, to preparing his disciples, quietly, privately, secretly, to take on the program in his absence after he's gone. If you will, he goes from offering the kingdom to getting ready for the cross. Starts here. Now, Matthew reminds us of this transition, and he reminds us that it was in keeping with prophecy. That's what we read there. Those quotes he gives from Isaiah, they all foretell, foretold the Messiah's rejection and the need for him to take his message elsewhere to Gentiles. Look in Isaiah 42, is what he's quoting for here. And Isaiah 42 says, The Messiah would come to Israel as a servant, that is, as one chosen by the Father to serve the Father's purpose. He wouldn't be a man of ego. He wasn't going to be a man of self-promotion. He wasn't going to be the kind of man who tried to make it all about himself. He was a humble man. And even when the time came to present himself to Israel as their Messiah, Jesus let the Spirit of God do the talking. He didn't promote himself when he did a miracle or when he did some other kind of, of work. The Spirit of God, Isaiah says, was upon him. And that anointing of the Spirit was the means by which Jesus performed his many miracles. We covered some of this earlier in the book of Matthew when we saw Jesus receiving the Holy Spirit at the point of his baptism. That was the enabling member of the Godhead that Jesus depended upon to do the the miraculous works he did. Jesus was all God and always is, but when he took the form of man, he emptied himself, and as such, he had to depend on the Spirit in order to do the miraculous things that he used to be able to do before he emptied himself. 
Remember, he's no less God because he emptied himself. He's just not able to do what he did before in the form of man, at least for a time. So he depended on the Spirit. This is what John says in John 5, 36. This is Jesus speaking. He says, The testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, John the Baptist, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the works, hear that? The miraculous works, the works he has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me, and the Father has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has testified to me. And you've neither heard his voice nor seen him in any form. His point was, you see my doing these works, you see the power of God, you see the testimony of God working through me to tell you that I am who I say I am. But then look at what Isaiah says, and here's what Matthew is going in this quote. Isaiah says that Israel would reject their Messiah despite the Spirit's testimony. Remember, when I say the Spirit's testimony, I mean in the miraculous works that Jesus did, that was a testimony of the Spirit to the people of Israel that they were looking at their Messiah. All right? Isaiah says, nonetheless, he would be rejected. And then look in verse 19. Matthew quotes Isaiah saying, Despite Israel's rejection, their Messiah was not going to stand on street corners begging or arguing people into believing in him. He was willing to let them reject him. That's the point. Jesus wasn't going to quarrel. He wasn't going to beg, which is why the truth then had to go to the Gentiles instead, at least for a while. But here's the real kicker. Here's the part that I love the most. Nevertheless, Israel was not going to be forsaken by God because of that rejection. The Messiah would win them over eventually. Isaiah uses two euphemisms here that Matthew quotes. And these euphemisms explain that the Messiah's grace and mercy for Israel does not end. In verse 20, Isaiah says that the Messiah would not break off a battered reed or put out a smoldering wick. These are euphemisms, and they're not natural to us. We don't use these, so we might not understand them. Let me just explain them to you. These phrases essentially mean making something out of nothing. That is, a battered reed, a reed is a tall plant, you know, a stiff Tall plant, grows by water, and they're useful when they're stiff. They can be used as a stick, they can be used as a supporting rod in some kind of structure. You can use them for various things, even a pen. But if they're battered and limp and don't work anymore, you know, you throw them away. They're not worth anything anymore. And a smoldering wick, well, wicks are in candles. They're supposed to be lit. They're supposed to make light. Smoldering means it's going out. It's not working anymore, right? You and I would look at a battered reed or a smoldering wick, and we'd say, that's useless, throw it away, go look somewhere else. We're done with it, right? Not the Messiah. You know, we would have supposed that after Israel rejected their Messiah, God would have said, okay, I'm done with you. I gave you your chance. But that's not how God works, thankfully, for all of us. Isaiah says the Messiah will not break off a battered reed, nor put out a smoldering wick. He will make something out of them, despite the fact that they are almost useless. He will lead justice to victory, Isaiah says, which is a way of saying, eventually, he will bring a just outcome for God's people. But what is the just outcome? Well, you might say, well, Israel's just outcome should be to be rejected, after all. Wouldn't that be just, given what they did to, to, uh, to Jesus? Ah, but you're forgetting God's word. You see, justice isn't measured in terms of what we do. Justice is measured in terms of God's Word. God's Word is the standard of justice. And God's Word said what He would do for His people Israel when He made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if God rejected His own people, He would be going back on His own Word. And if God can go back on His Word concerning Israel, He could go back on His Word concerning you and me. But He doesn't do that. So in justice... Israel will still yet have opportunity. So what Matthew is doing briefly before he moves to the big moment that we're now about to look at is he reminds us that yes, this is when Israel lost the kingdom. The Bible said that would happen, but the Bible also says it's not the end of the story for Israel. And that's an important footnote to make note of, to know going into this story. Otherwise, you might be tempted to think this is the very end of the people of God entirely. But it's not. So the kingdom offer has to go somewhere. It's not going to be Israel's for a time. It's going to be the Gentiles, Isaiah says in verse 21. And this is all prologue, on Matthew's part, to the rejection moment. And so it's important now that you and I understand what's happening right now. What's happening right now 
is that the time for Israel to receive what Jesus offered them in that day has come to its end or is about to in the scene that now follows. As a result, it will go to the Gentiles instead. And yet there is still in God's plan a day coming in which this same opportunity returns once more for their for the people of Israel. We'll explain that more when we get to the end of 12 and into 13. For now, what we have in front of us is the moment of the rejection and the moment in which they lost paradise. Let's study that now. And it begins in verse 22 with another healing. Verse 22, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him. So the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, This cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they say, Well, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Well, that's it right there. It doesn't seem like much, does it? But we will unpack it. So at this point, verse 22, sometime after the Sabbath, sometime after he healed the wet man with the withered hand, he's presented with another man who's demon-possessed, and Jesus healed him. Now, this has happened at many times in the past. We see a few other examples of it in the Scripture. In fact, we studied a couple already earlier chapters of Matthew. And remember when we did study a little about demon possession earlier, when we saw the, the man who was demon possessed in the Gerasenes and uh, Jesus cast them out, they went into pigs and the pigs went into. Remember all of that? Maybe. Well, when we did that, you would remember we talked a little bit about demon possession. It was an opportunity for us to do a little demon possession 101. And uh, let me just remind you of some of the important details we studied. We learned that demons are angels that fell into sin by following Satan when Satan rebelled from God. They chose to become part of Satan's army, basically. And today they serve Satan in a spiritual battle between Satan and God. And humanity is a pawn that Satan uses in the midst of that battle. And when demons target human beings for attack, one of the tactics that they use is inhabiting, or we say indwelling, the physical body of a person. Now, if you think this is just Bible stuff from long ago, please let me correct you on that. It's happening around you every day. And many of the things you see on the news that are so horrible, I I suggest if you look more closely at them, you'll see the evidence that you're looking at people who are demon-possessed in many cases. Now, just as when the Spirit of God inhabits the body of a believer, that the demonic spirits also can inhabit bodies of unbelievers. And just as when the presence of the Spirit of God in your body produces a lasting positive change in behavior, we call that fruit, similarly, when a demon takes up residence in the body of a person, of an unbeliever, it will bring lasting negative effects on the person's behavior. Over time, the demon's presence in the person degrades that person's mental and physical state, leading to increasingly bizarre behaviors, The demon will speak to the person in their mind, often constantly, day and night, tormenting them with voices, uh, giving them condemnation, suggesting perversions of one kind or another. And, And as that goes on and on and on, that person begins to experience this growing sense of fear and dread and anxiety and paranoia, and they increasingly lose touch with reality. Eventually, their thoughts and emotions may get so disrupted by the negative influence of the demon in their body that they lose all touch with reality. They become incommunicative in some cases. I want you to notice in this case, the man who is possessed in in this story has been made blind and mute by the demon's presence. That shows you the extent to which their physical body can degrade as a result of the presence of a demon. What that also tells us is this man must be in the later stages of demon possession from what we see today. And once a demon is finished with a person, let's say they've used them to the point that they intended and they're no longer interested in that person, they can only leave the human body when it dies. We covered this, as you remember, earlier as well. They can't leave once they're in until the body dies, which is why, in so many cases, their tactic, their final tactic is to convince the person to kill themselves. Because that's their way out. That's why they wanted to go into the pigs. Remember, they run the pigs into the ground, into the water, and they were able to get out of the pigs that way. But there is a second way that a demon can leave a physical body once it's in the body. If they are cast out, or we we would say forced out, by the power of God, God can make them leave a body if he wants to. In Jesus' day, casting out demons from human bodies was not unknown. Obviously, Jesus did it, but even that's unique. In Jesus' day, the Lord equipped people, men, from time to time, 
by His Spirit, you might call it like a spiritual gift, and by that equipping, they could also cast out demons. We see evidence of that practiced in the Scriptures itself, in fact. Notice just a few verses later in this text. Look look at verse 27. In verse 27, Jesus challenges the Pharisees concerning their sons, who Jesus says are casting out demons. Now, sons here doesn't necessarily mean literally the Pharisees' offspring. It just is a, it's a way in Jewish terms of talking about the children of Israel, your other people of Israel, your other students, if you will. But Jesus' statement is not said sarcastically. He's saying it in a literal sense. They had people in, Jude- in Judaism who were casting out demons from time to time. He's referring to that. If you were to go to Acts 19, you know the famous story of Sceva and his seven sons? They get in trouble because they try to cast out demons the wrong way. But they are called traveling exorcists in that passage, and not with any sense of irony. They are that person. They went around casting out demons. They got in trouble because they picked the wrong demon and they did it the wrong way. All right, so we know the Lord allowed that uh, certain people to have the power to remove demons when that suited His purpose. But we also know that that power, when God granted it, let's call it a spiritual gift for lack of a better term. When God granted that spiritual gift of being able to cast out demons, He came with certain restrictions. We know this from rabbinical writing of the day. Think back a few months ago if you remember to the study of Matthew 8. I'm sure you remember it vividly. We remember that miracle that we saw there of Jesus healing the leper. Remember that one? And if you don't, it's kind of self-explanatory, healing a leper. But when we covered that chapter, I told you that up to that moment, there had never been a single case in all the history of Israel of a Jew being healed of leprosy. That was the first time it had ever happened. And yet I also told you there was an entire chapter in the law, in the book of Leviticus, that's dedicated to teaching Israel how to deal with someone if they are healed of leprosy. Well, that, in, that creates this interesting conundrum. The rabbis notice this, this kind of contradiction. We have this chapter that tells us how to do this thing, but it's never actually ever happened. And they kind of wondered, why would God give us this chapter and then never do it? And as they thought about that, they concluded, the Lord must be reserving the power of healing a leper for his Messiah. He's not giving it out to everyone. He's holding on to it so that when the person comes and can heal a leper, that will be the sign to us that we're looking at the Messiah. And the rabbis came up with this concept called the the Messianic miracle. A miracle that God reserved only for his Messiah so that it would be a calling card, as it were, so that when you saw it, you'd know you were looking at the Messiah. And that's what they taught people in their day. They taught people, if you see someone do this, you know you're looking at the Messiah. And one of those things was healing a leper. But another of those messianic miracles, something they had never seen anyone else do, and yet they anticipated would one day happen, was the casting out of a mute demon. Now, casting out demons generally, we've already said, that's not unique. But casting out a mute one was unique. Now, why? Why that? Well, it goes to the way that casting out demons was done. The way you had to cast out a demon, according to the rabbinical teaching, according to the way Israel learned it, you could only cast out a demon, that is, let's say, the person who has a spiritual gift to do it. The only way they could do it was if they learned the name of the demon that was inhabiting the person's body. So the exorcist would speak directly to the person. They'd ask that person, can you tell me the name of the demon that's in you? Sometimes the demon might have told the person the name already, and that's how they'd learn it. Other times, they might have to ask the demon to actually divulge the name himself, and then they're trying to negotiate and perhaps coax the demon into saying his name. When the demon spoke, of course, he was speaking using the voice of the person, speaking through the vocal cords of the individual. And according to the rabbinical teaching of the day, if you could gain the name of the demon, you could cast out the demon by calling on it by name. And then, of course, we're talking about someone who's been given that power by God. But that's how the work would be done. And the demon would be removed from the person. If you want some evidence of all of this, remember I said earlier I make all this stuff up. Right now you're really believing that. But if you want some evidence of this, you see Jesus actually using this rabbinical method himself at one point in the Gospels. In the incident of the demons who possessed that man living in the tombs, in Luke 8.28, listen to this, and look at Jesus' method. 8.28, seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. Now, who's speaking there? The demon in the man, right? Then, verse 29, For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. 
There's that degrading behavior I talked about, right? And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for we are many, many demons that entered him. There's Jesus using the rabbinical method. Now, Jesus didn't have to use the rabbinical method. I'm not saying that. He's God. What I'm saying, though, is he was doing something that was very traditional, very common. Look for the name of the demon. And that's one example of it. There's other examples of this, too, which we'll come back to. But it brings me here now to the moment in Matthew 12. I don't want to leave the text for too much longer. I want to get back to what we're looking at. You have a demon that's inhabited a man's body, and as a result, he's mute. Now, if he's mute, you can't learn the name of the demon. If you can't learn the name of the demon, as an exorcist, you're stuck. You basically turn around and tell the person, can't help you here, sorry, and you move on to the next case. Because it's beyond the means of an ordinary person to do something like this. That's why the rabbis had come to say, if you ever see someone cast out a mute demon, you're looking at the Messiah. It's a messianic miracle. And for that reason... Jesus gets a special response. Now, before we look at the response in Matthew 12, I want to give you one more example of Scripture of what I'm saying, because I don't want you to just take what I'm saying on face value. I think it's important that you see that we have some support in Scripture for this. Let me show you an example of how this does not work. In Mark chapter 9, in Mark chapter 9, there's a story in which another boy is is possessed by demons, and the disciples of Jesus try to remove the demons. Mark 9, 17. One of the crowd answered Jesus, saying, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit, which makes him mute. Notice. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth, and he grinds his teeth, and he stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. Okay? Mute. And Jesus answered them and said, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long will I put up with you? Bring him to me. Have you ever wondered why Jesus was so upset at them? You know, in that context, it almost seems a little off that Jesus would just say that to them when they just asked him to help, right? What's he upset about? Well, now you'll understand. A few verses later, the disciples asked Jesus this question. When they came into the house, the disciples began questioning him privately, why could we not drive him out? Look what Jesus says. He said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. I think what he just said, Jesus here dealing with a mute demon again. His disciples trying to cast it out, couldn't do it. And it's because they couldn't learn the demon's name, I'm telling you. And therefore they couldn't use the normal rabbinical method. And then Jesus does it, and they say, well, how come you can do it and we can't do it? And Jesus says, this kind, meaning mute demons, don't come out by any way except prayer. Now what is prayer? Prayer is an appeal to God. So in other words, he's saying, only God can do this one. You can't. You've got to ask God for this one. Mute demons, off limits for you. That's why Jesus said to them earlier, you unbelieving generation, how long should I have put up with you? He's saying, you should be able to know that this is a messianic miracle. You don't do this one. Only the Messiah does this one. Moreover, you should have called me earlier because you should know I'm the Messiah. And as such, you should have expected me to be all over this one. He's indicting their unbelief because they're not seeing the signs that they've been taught to look for, and they're missing the big picture. That's how important this mute demon issue is. It was a calling card for the Messiah, along with the leper that we saw earlier. Now, back to Matthew 12. Look what happens next. Verse 23. The crowd sees Jesus perform the miracle that we establish now for ourselves. That's an important miracle. That's a miracle that tells you that you're looking at a special person, right? They see it, and what do they say? This can't be the son of David, can he? They're acknowledging what they know they just saw. They're acknowledging they just saw a Messiah act. But the problem is, they're saying, I didn't think this guy would be our Messiah. He doesn't really look the part. You know, he's he's a little short. He's kind of from a nowhere place. He, he, he's not very impressive. You know, the, t- the, the title Son of David, by the way, is a special title Jews use in reference to the Messiah because they know that their Messiah would be a descendant. Of David, So it's a shorthand way of saying the Messiah. So they ask this question. They don't say, oh, the son of David. No, they say, this can't be the son of David, can it? They don't see a Messiah who fits their preconceived notions of who the Messiah would be. And as a result, they're looking at a plain man from a nothing town, hardly Messiah material in their minds, and they can't wrap their heads around an ugly plain Messiah. 
And so they ask their, their leaders who are standing by in that area, they're saying, this can't be the son of David, can it? What they're asking for is an opinion. They're asking for the religious leaders to render a judgment concerning the claims of this man. Because that Messiah miracle, you can't deny that. Somebody needs to explain that to us. They direct their question to the leaders. And these guys, experts in all things Messiah, they're going to rule. And they got a big problem right now. Because they too saw that miracle. They too know what that miracle means. And obviously they do not want to confirm Jesus as the Messiah. He's already rejected Pharisaic Judaism. He's told them that their oral law, the Mishnah, is of no authority. So if they were to confirm him as Messiah, they know they are out of authority. They are out of any position of power. They're not going to do that. And yet, they can't deny the miracle. They can't say, that's a card trick. There's a mute blind man, possessed by a demon, who's now talking and seeing. That's not easy to fake. So, what they say instead in verse 24, and this is their, this is their way of avoiding the whole problem, they say that Jesus performed this miracle, yes, but he did so by the power of Beelzebul. Now, my translation reads Beelzebul. The Greek word that's being used there actually is Beelzebub. And the difference is significant because Beelzebub is translated Lord of Flies. Lord of Flies. And that was a name that the Jews had given to Satan to mock him. The Lord of Flies. So what the Pharisees just said is that Jesus did what he did by the power of Satan. Which explained why he did something ordinary people could not do. And the leader's response and the crowd's willingness to accept that response is the precise moment that the kingdom was lost. And you'll know that more clearly next week. I'm just going to leave you with that now, but we're going to look at the rest of the consequence here a little today. This is the crucial moment where Jesus withdraws the kingdom proposal from this generation of Israel. They just went too far. You know how your mom always says, don't go there? They went there. And there's no going back. We'll see that moment more clearly, as I said, next week. But I want to examine some of it now. Look at verse 25. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? But if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason they will be your judges. So look at Jesus' first series of responses here. And really what he does is he shows the ridiculousness of the Pharisees' explanation. He, he notice Matthew starts there in verse 25. He knew their thoughts. Now that's an important phrase. Don't, over, don't run past that. What thoughts is he knowing? Remember, the, the, the Pharisees just spoke their response. They spoke it out loud to the people. So their, expl, their explanation were not thoughts. Uh, everyone knew what they just said. So Jesus wasn't knowing anybody's thoughts when it comes to that statement. That's not what Matthew's talking about. Matthew's referring to the unspoken thoughts in the minds of the crowd as they heard that explanation. And in hearing that explanation, he knew what they thought. You know what they thought? They were thinking, yeah, makes sense. That must be it. Makes more sense. That guy can't be the Messiah. Glad we got that explanation. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he says to them, you guys are ridiculous. You're believing the most ridiculous thing. He exposes the nonsensical nature in verses 25 and 26. He says, A kingdom or a city or a house that's divided against itself will not stand. Now that metaphor is well known, but let me give you the full context of it. The context of that metaphor is warfare. It's a context in which you have a battle or a war taking place where there's a kingdom or a city or a house that's battling some common enemy. And Jesus says, Winning a war against a determined enemy is hard enough as it is. But if you try to fight that war when everyone is not working together but is actually fighting against themselves, you have no chance at all. So it's not just that if you fight against one another, your house will fall. That may be true, but that's not the point. The point is, your house will fall in contest against an enemy if you're not fighting with each other, but rather against each other. That's the real context. So what's his point here? Well, in the metaphor, he's speaking about the spiritual war that's taking place between Satan and God. And Satan and his demons are waging that war, and they cannot afford to waste time fighting themselves when they have a God that they're trying to fight who is far more powerful than them. That's the point. So what Jesus is saying is, if what you say is true, and I am casting out demons with the power of Satan, 
then what you're saying is Satan's house is divided against itself. It was putting demons in bodies to fight God, but now it's casting demons out of bodies while trying to fight God. That's nonsensical. Satan's not going to do that. The argument doesn't make any sense. And then he makes a second point in verse 27. He says, if I'm casting out demons with the power of Satan, well, what power is your sons using? He's showing the inconsistency of their logic because they're saying, oh, you're using Satan's power. But then they turn around and they say, oh, my good son here uses God's power. How do you know? How do you know I'm Satan and he's not Satan? How do you know who's who? I mean, it makes no sense here again. Why one assumption for that group and a different assumption for me? It's hypocritical. And finally, he makes his main point. Verse 28. He says, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, oh, well, that's a whole new thing then, right? If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, well, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder the house? He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. In verse 28, Jesus says, You know, there is one explanation for why all of this just happened. One that you haven't given. Another one, a better one, actually the only one. The other explanation for what just happened is, I just did this with the Spirit of God making it possible. How about that option, right? Now here again, he's referring to the anointing power of the Spirit. Here again, he's saying, I didn't do this per se. The Spirit of God through me did this. Now of course, Jesus and the Spirit and the Father are all one. I'm not... Changing that. What I'm saying, though, is he himself, Jesus himself, has made that distinction. He said, by the Spirit of God, through me, I made this happen. And I'm making that point to you now because it's going to become very important next week. He says, if that's what you just saw happen, then it leaves you with only one other conclusion possible. That is, if God just did the messianic miracle in your midst... He is testifying by that miracle that I am the Messiah. And if I am your Messiah, then your kingdom has come. That's the only other conclusion, the only reasonable conclusion. And yet, knowing their thoughts, Jesus recognized they would rather accept the illogical explanation of the Pharisees rather than the self-evident truth of what he just did. And so he finishes with a parable. And in that parable, he indicts their willful ignorance of the truth. He asks, how could someone enter into a strong man's house and carry off that guy's possessions without first binding the guy up? Now the answer is obvious, right? You can't. You could not walk into somebody's house if a strong man here refers to someone who's more powerful than you. You could not walk into the house of someone who's more powerful than you and just start taking their possessions while they sit idly by and watch you do it. They would stop you. So if you have taken their possessions, if you walk out and you've got them in your arms, the only conclusion I can make is you must have tied the guy up. How else could you have done that? In the parable, here's what he's saying. The strong man is Satan. And Satan's house is this world, for now, for a time. And Jesus is the one who has come into that house. And he has come into this world to plunder Satan's possessions by freeing people from the curse that Satan has brought them. He brings healing, he brings hope and joy and the promise of eternal life to the lost and the dying in this world, freeing us, as it were, from the dominion of Satan. And in this one specific example, that demon, think about this, that demon possessed that man, right? And in possessing that man, that was the strong man's possession. And what Jesus did was he showed up and took that possession away from Satan by freeing that man from the demon. And so what do you conclude? If a strong man had his possession taken away, the only conclusion you can make is Jesus isn't working with Satan. Jesus just bound Satan. He just bound him. I mean, in a metaphoric sense, he he held him from being able to stop him. And if Jesus has the power to bind the one sending demons into bodies, then he must be a greater power than the one sending the demons into the bodies. And if he is a greater power than the one sending the demons into the bodies, he is of God. (laughs) You see, every road leads to the same conclusion. And these people sit there saying, Oh, what a great explanation. Thank you, Mr. Pharisee. The unavoidable conclusion at this moment is that Jesus performed a messianic miracle. He is the Messiah. The kingdom has come. And therefore, the only reasonable response is to embrace him as king. That's it. 
I hope you don't come to the Gospels and come away thinking, you know, it was kind of a hard sell. I can see why people would be in confusion. I can see why maybe Israel didn't pick up on the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. He was always talking in parables. He always had this strange way of, we'll get there later, but friends, you need to understand that's not true. This is plain. You want to know how plain it is? They convict themselves. They say, this can't be the son of David, can it? They saw it. They knew it. They said it. They chose to believe that the miracle was done by the power of Satan rather than by the power of the Spirit of God because it suited them. And they lost the kingdom. Notice in verse 30, Jesus says, You know, you're either with me or you're against me. You are either on God's side or you're fighting against God. There is no third choice. So Israel made its choice. And next week when we get into the rest of this chapter, we're going to study the consequences of what just happened. But I want you to please consider tonight the ramifications of what he just said here, what Jesus just said. You are either for him or you are by definition against him. There's, there, there is before faith, there is after faith, there's no in between. And before faith, the Bible says clearly we are all enemies of God because we oppose the one who was sent to us by the Father. That's the natural starting point all human beings have. It's, it's common. Someone you know may be a good person. In many respects, they may be religious, they may be devout, they may be the most kind person you've ever met. But until they receive, by faith, the truth that Jesus is the one the Father sent in His name, Jesus says that person is against Him. He's an enemy of God, he or she. They don't know it, but they are. And that means there is truly no such thing as a seeker. I mean, think about it for a minute. There's no such thing as a seeker. I mean, there are, there are people who seek to know more about God, yes. But... The one who sits on the fence when it comes to Jesus. The one who's just kind of kicking the tires of Jesus. They think of themselves as a neutral party. I'm I'm agnostic. I'm working it out. I'm spiritual, but I don't know yet really where to put that. You know, whatever they say, they need to understand. The Bible says they are seen by God as an enemy. And we are all enemies until we're reconciled by God in faith through Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans 5.10, For while if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. You know, until you accept Christ as Messiah, Christ says you're scattering while He's trying to gather. I like to imagine like two kids playing where one kid's trying to pull all the marbles together and the other kid's just kicking them away as he tries. I mean, it's a childhood example, but that's the kind of idea he's talking about. Israel made that choice. Israel made the choice to kick the marbles and call it religion and call it faith. They wanted healing when they liked it. They wanted fishes and loaves multiplied when they were hungry. They enjoyed hearing his teaching when they were bored. And they even recognized his power to do miraculous things and say it was from the Messiah, but they weren't willing to submit to his authority. That was the end of it. As Christians, we've all come to Jesus' side. I know we're not His enemy anymore. By faith, we've entered into the family of God. And I'm certainly hoping that's true for everyone who hears me tonight. But isn't that all the more reason to obey Him? I'm not going to go off on that. We've run out of time. And you're thankful for that as well. But just remember this. The Israel of Jesus' day, they missed their Messiah because they took their eyes off the Word of God and got wrapped up in this man-made religion of the Pharisees. That's why they missed him. Think about that. They chose the Pharisees over Jesus. What if there had been no Pharisees? I submit to you, if that, if that religious draw into legalism hadn't been there, all they would have seen is, this is the son of David, isn't it? And that would have been the end of it. We need to do better as Christians. That is, we need to remember that we too are waiting for the Messiah, for his return. Now, we aren't going to miss it because we're guaranteed to be a part of it. I understand that. But there's still the issue of what we do while we wait. And the Bible says we are to draw near to Christ with our hearts fully assured of who we are in faith. And that in the waiting, we are to make sure that we stay firm in the truth of Scripture, not distracted with temporal things, not letting our confidence waver because of whatever new faddish teaching comes along. And that's important because time is precious while we wait. And though we won't be pulled aside from Christ, having come to faith, we will be His forever. That doesn't mean we can't be pulled aside to wasting that time. And I just want you to understand that it doesn't happen one day, it happens over a period of time. And at some point, the truth might confront us out of Scripture, and then there's this other thing we've attached ourselves to, some false thing, and we just can't let it go. That's what happened there, that can happen to any of us. Next week, come back. 
I need you to know where the next part of this goes because so much of what changes in the gospel after this hinges on the next part. So let's pray and then I'll dismiss. We're not going to do a final song, so if you just stand with me as we pray and we'll be ready to dismiss immediately afterward. Dear Father, I pray a blessing on this audience of those who've come to listen to your word. I pray, Father, that what they've heard tonight would inspire them to dig deeper into your word, to understand it better so they may serve you better. I pray, Father, as well, that as we continue in this study, you draw us closer to you in the service that you call us to do here and elsewhere. Most of all, Father, that in our hearts we'd have a new and burning desire to share the truth with the world that is dying and lost, so that in the days that remain before Christ's return we may be a useful servant to witness to the truth of your gospel. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.